3. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today, I will be taught the word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert. My heart is receptive to receive the incorruptible word of God. And my life will never remain the same in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We're going to talk about the power of the blood of Jesus. Uh, on the 6th of uh, February, I think uh, all of you all uh, received the announcement that uh, probably that uh, I have uh, COVID-19, I uh, went for a test, but the self-administrated uh, test, uh, antigen the test uh, suggested that I have a COVID-19 and it was confirmed uh, on Monday when I went for the PCR. And of course, uh, the pain of uh, COVID-19, uh, the stress of it is uh, more than the physical pain that I went through on uh, Friday and Saturday. And of course, uh, the blow up you know, on Sunday. And I can feel the physically, it's like all my bones were burning, the very feverish and uh, uh, all my energy like being sapped, uh, being taken away, and my throat was so dry, and then I refused to talk, and even I can't even swallow up the saliva, it's so painful, and uh, even I take a few steps, uh, it's still uh, uh, quite incapable of doing it. So, well, thanks to Omicron, uh, at least I can tell you what it's all about, and uh, I can uh, suggest other information if you are going through it. I hope you don't have to. Right? But a lot of things uh, went through my mind at that uh, few uh, uh, days. And uh, of course, on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and Monday was the time that I experienced the full blown up uh, COVID-19 uh, experience. And I, I look into the statistics that the people who die and I say, number one, number two, number three, I seems to have uh, meet, uh, you know, at least about three of the seven criteria of a person who die of COVID-19. Firstly, I'm a bit of overweight. And secondly, I'm a, a heavy, I'm a diabetic. And then uh, thirdly, you know, uh, my age is almost uh, 70 years old. So of the seven criteria, of uh, statistics of the death, you know, uh, of uh, people uh, uh, die of uh, COVID-19, I met the uh, three of it. And then I was, uh, suddenly, it dawns upon me that, wow, like the angel of death is going to visit me. And a lot of things uh, went into my mind. And first thing is that, uh, oh my gosh, I said, wow, I keep on postponing to write my will and told my wife uh, better I thought down something that uh, anything happened to me, you know what to do. And then the uh, second day, I was thinking in my mind that, uh, Lord, this is not fair, right? There are a lot of things I haven't done yet. And I, I mean, it, 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 it's, a, it's a dilemma. It, it's a very, the feeling is a mixed feeling. Uh, first of all, it's like, I'm not afraid to die. And then secondly, yeah, at the same time, there is a secret desire, well, I want to experience death, what it is like. And for that matter, that I, I went into the, you know, the physical teaching about death and I went into the theological uh, uh, teaching about death. And then I, one day, I mean, on Tuesday, I told my wife, uh, oh, this will happen when I die. Well, my wife said, uh, stop it. It's not so exciting uh, teachings. Eh? <laughs> All right. But the, the thing is, like, I said, Lord, if, I, if, if I'm removed from this earth, Firstly, I can't take care of my wife, and then I will miss my grandchildren. I'm supposed to see them get married, right? See my children's children's children. I, I want to at least uh, witness uh, who knows that uh, I can officiate their marriages. So a lot of things uh, went to my mind. And then uh, it, was, uh, it was on the birthday, I was not able 
to come to church. And I was told that there are three big cakes prepared for me in the church. Lord, I say it's not fair because that seldom and my birthday falls on the 6th of February and then on Sunday itself. I got it, wash the cake. Uh, someone showed the, oh, that this is the cakes that prepare for you. I said, oh, go ahead, eat on my behalf. <laughs> right. And uh, there's another thought that uh, I, I, I told my children that the uh, uh, first or second week of uh, April, take note that uh, it's All Souls Day. Uh, maybe after the All Souls Day, we would like to uh, visit the grave, graveyards uh, in all in a uh, Niwana, uh, in Samanye, uh, visit my sister, visit my brother, visit my father, visit my mother, visit my uncle, visit my father-in-law, visit my mother-in-law. Wow, they can form a cell group there, right? And uh, I, but then I was thinking about it, uh, maybe this year will be tough, right, because of uh, COVID-19. But then I, I remember that uh, I, and uh, there's a message I told Joel from this time, I mean, last year onwards, that you and the two sons and my two grandchildren must go. There's something that I insist, right? I say that I insist that all your male children will come and observe whether it's a ritual or what you show it to them or I show it to them, why we need to come to the graveyard and then we said all this uh, this is the culture that we need to be perpetuated but then i told them the story about that in the, my early age my father will, will insist right, and the other son must go and then uh, we don't have a car we have to walk in Sungai bc then ampang and then the ulu clang and, and it was uh, terrible, you know, walk and walk and walk for hours. And then you find a place and then my father will say that most likely here because the tombstones was uh, washed away by flood. And then we have to look for it and the tall lalang. And then sometimes it's so horrible, so hot. And then a lot of insect spike, we will suffer from it. And then uh, my grandfather's uh, uh, tomb, uh, graveyard, and then my Grandmother, they are more uh, well kept. But interestingly, that once we arrive, my father will stop everybody, you know, my uncle, so about almost 20 of us. But wait, beside the grave uh, where, where the grandmother and the grandfather were buried. And then my mother and my aunt will take out pieces of paper, the joss paper, they are sprinkled, spread with chicken blood. We chicken blood, right? It's very fascinating. It's something put fear in our life, right? I mean, the young, as a young boy, I said, what? What does it mean like this? So we were stood from afar and watched my father and my mother place that uh, the, the joss paper that are sprinkled, spread with chicken blood and place it on top of the tombstone. And then my father will walk at the back of the, you know, the, the elevated ground, the earth, and then put another big of paper there. And then for a while, he, he stood there, and then I, I'm not sure what did he mumble. And then they said, okay, now we can walk in and do what you want to do. Some clean up and some spread, uh, spread out the, all, all the offerings and sacrifices, the joss paper, the joss sticks, and all this stuff. So for many years, I wanted to ask, uh, finally, uh, I asked my father and my mother, what, why you, you did that? I put those, uh, uh, you know, the just paper that are sprayed with the blood of the chicken. And then my mother said that, I do not know your, your grandmother did it, so I just do it, right? But then my father explained it in that is like, when you put the chicken, uh, I mean, the, uh, there is, uh, the paper that is uh, spread uh, with the uh, um, spray with, with the chicken uh, blood on the tombstone and there at the back of the, of the graveyard, it's implying you are building a hedge around that. 
Because he said that this place, a lot of spirits are around here. It can be that your grandfather and grandmother had invited a lot of people to come here. I mean, those are die, die already. So now is you put a circle, a hedge around here, only now the grandfather and the grandmother are here. Oh, whether you believe it or not, you can't see it, right? You just believe it, right? So I do not know the, where did the Chinese learn that cultural traditions of uh, placing uh, that uh, a joss paper they are sprayed with chicken blood. Anyway, we're going to talk about the power of the blood of Jesus. And we're going to read the scripture in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin in accordance with the riches of God's grace. We are going to amplify and talk a lot about the, uh, the word uh, redemption through his blood. And they are, he's talking about salvation. That we believe in Jesus. We are redeemed by his blood. And by his precious blood, we are saved and we are forgiven. So this is one of the languages of uh, the word salvation. So beside a redeem, a redemption, there's another word, the justification. That when we receive Christ as our personal Savior, power up by the blood of Jesus, we are justified before the presence of God. What does it mean here is that when we receive Christ, the blood of Jesus cover us. That by nature, because of our sinful nature, we cannot go before the presence of God. Because we are sinful. And the requirement, the requirement, requirement of God is that there must be a blood sacrifice. There must be a blood sacrifice of an innocent in the Old Testament, an innocent, an innocent animal or a sinless human being, which our Lord uh, Jesus Christ. And then uh, Jesus died for us. And then as we approach the presence of God, God sees the blood of Jesus offered for us. And instead of saying that we are guilty for all have seen and fall short of the glory of God, instead of saying that we are guilty, we are not guilty. We are set free. So that's the word justification. So there's another word for salvation in the Bible, adoption, adoption. It said that uh, we are born outside of the fringe of the commonwealth of the kingdom of God. But then because of the precious blood of Jesus, the son of God who gave his life as a ransom for many, for all of us, we receive the Holy Spirit as an initial Initial the guarantor, a guarantee of their salvation. That's why in the book of Romans chapter 8, it says that because of the presence of the Holy Spirit, our inner spirit, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit bears an uh, inner witness with our spirit that we cry out, Abba, Father, in our spirit, Abba, Father. So it's adoption. So we are adopted into the kingdom of God into God's uh, home. And in the and, and Paul uh, took it the Roman traditions that the adoption in the Roman society is more is just as powerful as the blood son or blood children of the parents. So it's like even though we are born outside of the fringe of the kingdom of God, but because of the blood of Jesus, our bond with our parents as strong as much as uh, the, the original the children of the family members. Now, of course, there's another word, the uh, regenerations that uh, we call it sanctification, sanctification that when we receive Christ as our personal savior in the sight of God, we are set free from our sin. Set free from our sin. And then the process of sanctification 
daily, daily we are sanctified by the power of the Holy Spirit, cleansed by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it, it means that uh, sometimes uh, we make a fun of it. Have patience with me. I'm still under construction. Be patient with me. God is still molding, molding my character. Right? God, God has begun a good work in me. And slowly, just believe in the process that when the day comes, I will receive glorification. Right? So this is everything about uh, salvation. A quick uh, study about... Uh, you know, the 101 about salvation. But today we talk about in Christ, we have redemption to his blood, receiving the forgiveness of our sin in accordance with the grace of God. Okay. And uh, let's go a little bit of study about the blood of Jesus. Uh, go back to the original or origin of the world in the Genesis 3, 21. It says like this, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothe them. It's back into the chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3, talk about the history of mankind. We know about the creation of Adam and if they were placed in the beautiful garden of Eden. But right in the midst of the beauty of the garden, there was a tree of a knowledge of good and evil. They were commanded right, uh, by the Lord that not to eat the fruit of that tree. But we understand that we, we read about the story about uh, Eve uh, took the fruit and then uh, gave it to Adam. And then they were uh, suddenly their eyes found wisdom. It's more about they found themselves uh, naked before each other. So they have a knowledge of uh, good and Evil. And because of their nakedness, they hid behind bushes. And when God came into the cool of the garden, according to the Bible, and he was asking Adam and Eve, where are you? And Adam and Eve came out and covered their naked body with the leaves of the fig tree. Fig tree. And God asked them, uh, why, why did you do that? Oh, we were naked. Who told you so? Who told you so? But according to the, uh, we read in the Genesis account, chapter 1 and chapter 3, and God said that it doesn't work like this. You have seen. It's not through your own works and your, to your creativeness to cover your nakedness, not according to your own ways and wisdom. But I have a better way, and this is the spiritual way, the godly way. So in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, the Bible say, imply here that God killed and slaughtered an innocent animal, most likely a goat or a lamb. And then the blood poured out, Life uh, being removed and then skin the animal, took the skin of the animal and cover the nakedness or cover the sin of the first couple. That's why in uh, Hebrews uh, 9, uh, 22, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, it says uh, pointedly to us, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. There's no forgiveness of sin. So, right in the first uh, story of man, that we, there is a blood uh, sacrifice here. And then the further the forward, we talk about Abel and Cain, the first two children of the parents. And uh, the account recorded that each one of them brought the first fruit of their products. The first fruits of their produce. And uh, Cain, uh, being a farmer, brought in the first fruit, the most likely the vegetable. And Abel, being a shepherd, brought in a lamb and offered that sacrifice to God. And in our Sunday schools, we talk about the account that God was so 
please be able. And God was not looking at the sacrifices of a king. And how did Abel learn that, that God prefer animal sacrifices than uh, products of, of on the ground? But this is uh, what we call a progressively uh, God revealed his uh, story to us. And Cain was so uh, uh, angry because uh, God was blessing Abel day by day. That jealousy turned into anger, and finally, Abel was killed by Cain. And then the Bible said that the blood flowed into the ground. It became a curse for Cain. And Cain has to run away, right? So we, we see here, we talk about the, the, there's a lot of things, uh, almost about more than a uh, uh, few hundred uh, account about the blood, the, the subject of the bl blood, right? Okay, now a little bit of uh, interpretations of the Bible. You talk about the first mentioned principle of, of uh, interpreting the Bible. For example, that uh, when Abraham was told by God to offer his son uh, Isaac to him. And of course, they went up to the mountain Moriah when Abraham was up, about to plunge that sharp knife into the heart of his son, only son, Isaac, to offer it to God. God said, hold on, you have passed the test. Yeah, you have obeyed me. You have gained the righteousness in my sight. And uh, in the, uh, that God, instead of uh, taking the life of Isaac, took uh, uh, a ram, was found, a goat was found uh, in that uh, hill, and it was a slaughter, and then uh, I have a blood sacrifice, and then uh, it was a burnt uh, uh, sacrifice to God. But when, when uh, Isaac asked Abraham, where are we going? Where are we going? And Abraham answered to worship God. To worship God. So there is a first mention about worship. Worship is not genuine worship if there is no sacrifice. There is no sacrifices at all. It won't be a worship. So here we mentioned about the first mention, the principle in the Bible that right in the beginning, God has shown to Adam and Eve that to restore the relationship between God and man, it needs an innocent animal to be sacrificed. The blood has to flow out from that animal, then burn, and then uh, using the skin to cover the sins of Adam and Eve. That's why we use the bombastic uh, word, the uh, atonement. Atonement means cover the sins of uh, Adam and Eve. So right in the beginning, we have a story, the theological truth that without, without the shedding of blood, without the sacrifices, there will be no remission of sin, no forgiveness of sin. And then we learn that God if you want to gain access to the presence of God, there must be a blood sacrifice. I, I don't understand why did God need that? Why did God need that? To gain access into the presence of God, you need a blood sacrifice. If you go to the Levitical uh, worship and sacrifice, is that uh, before they go into the holy and holies, sacrifices must be done for Aaron, for the high priest, and for him, for his family, and for the nation. Then Aaron only can enter into the holy of holies. Without the sacrifices, it says that the Bible says that he cannot enter because he enter, he feels the presence of God, he will die. So to gain access into the presence of God, there must be a blood sacrifice. And then to maintain that relationship, there must also be blood sacrifice or burnt offering. Okay? 
Let's go further, right? Today's a bit deep, right? So uh, start up your mind a little bit. And I was uh, reading through, so I can, uh, it's almost uh, 40 to 50 pages uh, from the day uh, 6th of February until now is one month because, you know, uh, during that period, I was very interested that I pray that the blood of Jesus cover me, cover my family, cover the church, right? So, so we talk about the shed the blood uh, throughout history uh, from Adam and Eve to Abraham and then to Moses and then later on fast forward to the, our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? So redemption through the blood of Jesus. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. What do you mean by redemption? And uh, the word redemption uh, in uh, Greek, the first meaning is a very common word. It's talking about buying and selling in the marketplace. You are able to take home a thing or the, some uh, uh, food stuff or even whatever stock. You are able to take that stock uh, away from the marketplace because you have in exchange given a uh, a sum of money, right? You have paid for it, therefore you can take it back. But there's a, another meaning is a Lutron. Uh, it means that uh, it's quite different. Instead of buying a thing or a stock or even animal, he's talking about buying a human slave. A human slave. So quite common in the Roman world, in the Roman Empire, the spoils of war, that those who have uh, I mean, lost in the war and then uh, you, know, you, you follow the wrong uh, leader, you were taken in as slaves. And then some of them are being captured from a far country. And they will be uh, put uh, buried uh, in the marketplace to be sold as a slave. But they are they were good some uh, benefactor that they purchased that slave with a sum of money and set them free from slavery. When they are set free from slavery, they will receive a certificate, a paper certificate, and say that they are free person. They are free person. They are not slaves. They look like slaves, but in the pre presenting uh, authoritative uh, paper and say that, well, they were free men. But some people uh, purchase uh, these slaves and say, we will keep them in the household. And then they will puncture a hole in the ear loop and put a earring. And when people see a earring, they knew that this person it's a slave. This person is a slave. So now the fashion is like, you wear your ring, it's more of a cosmetic for beauty. In the olden days, it is, oh, you are the slave, right? So now we, we, we put earrings, uh, we are slaves to, I do not know, right? Maybe ladies are uh, slave to husband or no men are so wear, wear, wear ring uh, for what purpose? The Indians love to wear rings, the men. Uh, why? They belong to somebody? I can't hear you. <laughs> Open your mouth. <laughs> Is that a blessing or what? Hmm, okay, but well, I see a doubt, a small, small earring. Huh? <laughs> you are sure? Yeah, you you are very uh, angry because uh, she did not ask you, right? <laughs> okay, la. okay. So when we say about redemption, it, it, it's talking about uh, that God uh, redeem us from the power of sin through the precious blood of our Lord uh, Jesus Christ. We are set free. We are released from the power of sin. 
And that's why we say that there is power in the blood of Jesus. Let me read the Romans 6, 16 to 18. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness or life. But thanks be to God that to, though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and become slaves to righteousness or to life. Right? So because of the precious blood of Jesus, we believe him, we are set free from the power of sin or from the clutch from the influence of sin. Okay, let's go further. Now, what is the main point here that I'm coming to? Let you see the history of the power of the blood of Jesus that uh, progressively we have a revelation from God to Genesis and then to Exodus and then later on uh, the five books of Moses and do the old, throughout the Old Testament, the kings and the prophets and right to the time Nathaniel Nathaniel saw Jesus saw Jesus right and then uh, they were watching uh, John the Baptist John the Baptist uh, rush, uh, baptizing the Gentile people the people and then Nathaniel was uh, standing under the tree and said that behold the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world Behold, the Lamb of God. John the Baptist saw it and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. And then, of course, later on, Jesus walked into the Jordan River and John the Baptist uh, baptized him. So, prayer for protection through the precious blood of Jesus. Okay, we back up a little bit in the book of Exodus 12, uh, 13. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Just like the people of Israel in Egypt, they were facing a great battle. And God to various plagues, forcing the hands of the Pharaoh to set free the people of Israel. And now the greatest fear, not even the people of Egypt, but the people of Israel, were placed in a place of fear and anxiousness. They did not know what will happen because the last plague, as pronounced by Moses, saying that the firstborn male child of all the households of Egypt, the Egyptians, the firstborn of all animals, male animal, will die on that night. However, the children, the firstborn children, male children of the Jewish homes or the animals will be spared. But they have to slaughter a goat or a lamb and using a big a hyssop or the big brush. And then the sprinkle the blood on the door Pose, so the lintel and the side of the door pose and close the door. And at night, the angel of death that passed, that they having the permission of God will pass through the streets of Egypt and without the blood on the door post, the first male child or the first male animal of that household, they will die. They will die. That's why the word is called Passover. Passover. So imagine the great scream, the great uh, you know, lamentation that came upon the nations of Egypt. Every household, almost every household will, will have a male child, whether the father or the first son. There will be a great cry and scream. And then the, the scream and that the lamentation that went throughout the land also heard by the nations of Israel. 
I think they were also the, you know, bundled together behind closed doors in fear. They don't know what will happen. I think we are in the same scenario, same situation. We have a wall, a Russian that just flex it, it's their muscle against a small nation, the Ukraine. So they say the next thing China will move towards Taiwan. Yeah, maybe Malaysia will move against Singapore. The big fish eat the small fish and use history as a guide. Oh, Singapore used to belong to Malaysia. Oh, sorry, I don't say that this in the, in the TV. <laughs> right? I mean, Russia will say that, yeah, yeah. Ukraine uh, used to be part of the uh, Soviet Union, uh, history and all this other thing. We have the Omicron. And then uh, because of the war in Europe, we are interdependent. So you, you can rest assured next week, the price of uh, petrol will go up. In the United States, they're screaming already, right? The one gallon uh, is going to $4, right? For two something, reach out to four dollars. You get the court can go up to five dollars. And they were saying that one toothpaste instead of three dollars, very soon in one month's time, it will be twelve dollars. Your toothpaste. Yeah. There's a great upheaval around the world, and because of the interdependence of nations, we will be affected. But praise unto the Lord. And there is a promise. There is a promise, right? That from the Bible that we will, you know, we will by faith and believe that we will spare all this. We're talking about, uh, let me just go, uh, go quickly, uh, Leviticus 16, 15. Talking about the animal sacrifice surely revealed to us the pattern of a perfect sacrifice in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So in the Leviticus 16, 15, it says that, He shall then slaughter the goat or the lamb for the sin offering for the people and take his blood behind the curtain. It's called the Holy Holies. And do with it as he did with the bull's blood. He shall sprinkle it on the atonement, cover the mercy seat and in front of it. So once a year, that the Aaron, the high priest, will go into the Holy of Holies. And before he did that, and he will offer a sacrifice for himself, another sacrifice uh, for his family, and then for the nations. Or oh, you could call it the scapegoat also. I mean, we, we will talk more later on. We have a chance to talk about that. So he, there are seven times that on the day of Atonement, the blood was sprayed seven times into the Holy of Holies. For showed, I mean, the type, the pattern, the way Jesus' blood was spray, spray seven times. So what I want to say here is that it's a type. What Aaron had done in the Holy of Holies is being a work out in the life of Jesus. When he was about to be betrayed, about to be hung on the cross, and then hung on the cross, that he was that uh, seven times, the seven parts of his body pour out blood. Very significantly as portrayed in the sacrifices of Aaron. Seven times. Seven times. So the Lord Jesus Christ become the type of the perfect lamb as portrayed in the Old Testament. All right? Let me uh, go fast forward. It's more for my own consumption. Okay, let me read here. But Christ being, but Christ being come and high priest of God, things come as a greater, more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by the own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. This is a whole sermon ministered to me during the time I was crying out. 
the responsibility as a husband, responsibility as a father, responsibility as a grandfather, as a pastor. I said, Laura, that it, it, I felt it's not time yet. I, I went through two uh, very nasty uh, critical accidents. Wheel came off on my car, the highway, and then uh, head, head on, uh, on a crash uh, with a lorry, you know, with uh, 10 of my students inside the van, and then uh, the van was uh, written off, but none of us was hurt. Only one, uh, we all, uh, you know, the shower with uh, all the glasses, uh, fell from the roof, fell into the rock when I baptized people in the partisan, uh, and then people had to carry me up because I felt that my whole body paralyzed. It's a brought fear to the whole congregation when I was baptizing them. I just uh, slipped and then fell uh, so hard on the rock. I was, for, for one minute, I was paralyzed. I was not able to move any parts of my limbs. Fell from the roof and then have an angelic being in the form of my wife uh, carry me through the two nasty car accidents. I survived. I said, Lord, how come I did not survive Omicron? <laughs> I said, not fair. Not to, due to my stupidity. I observed all the SOP, right? I wa wash uh, so many times my hands and then my hands become so fair. Wash away the skin and wash away all the dirt from my hand. How many times you wash your hand, please? I counted one time, more than 10 times one day. Yeah. I covered up. One time my wife said, must I cover up my nose with, with, with two uh, face masks? I say, if I cover up with two, I think I will die of face masks because I can't breathe anymore. So I get a better one, you know. Things, uh, those... Uh, Face masks are sold by DIY. You know, don't do it. Uh, you die by yourself. Uh. <laughs> don't do it yourself. So, Lord, I did everything. I did not get in the church. I did a survey. Did any one of us get uh, COVID-19 from the church? No. We brought it from outside. We got it from outside. I, got, I went to my in-laws reunion, and the three, four of them I got it, and I was... And I got it, right? And my wife said, of all the people, you got it. And he did, she did not get it. And the rest of people sat in the same table, did not get it. How come you were the one get it? You must be the scapegoat. Eh? The sacr sacrificial lamb for the, my in-law's family. But that was the time I started talking about the blood of Jesus. But the song that we used to sing in my early days, there's power in the blood of Jesus. And I acted like Job. You know, Satan answered the Lord and said, Do Job fear God for nothing? Has not thou made an hedge about wire about him, about his house, and about all that he had on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and the substance is increased in the hand, in the land. Verse 5, and it was so when days of their feasting were gone about, they jaw, the job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them. For Job say, it may be that my son have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. That time he got seven children. Every day they party. Never mind, he one son, one sacrifice animal. Every day they party, you know, how many goats and, and sheep uh, that Job has to sacrifice. Thank God we don't have to do it. Job pray, offer sacrifices for his children so much that a barbed wire, a hedge of protection over their family, God was on them, God was beside them, and God was in them. I'm so convinced. I start praying for you guys every Monday morning. I think twice a day I'm doing it. Done. But this tomorrow you have that prayer. I'm going to pray for you, right? Not every day. You know you get fed up of me, right? 
I, I felt that you know, I need to pray for the covering of the, my people in the church. English Tamil, if I can uh, name all them, name by one, that one by one. Right? Job did exactly what he was to do, do. Burn offering for every one of them. For himself, for the house and the family, for his possessions and property, for his daily works and his life in society, his influence. You look into the life. Right? When God removed all the barbed wire and the hedge, what happened? His property was taken away. His life uh, uh, was almost gone. His influence of society will go down the drain, uh, you know? His influence just went south and then he, his pain uh, went in the north. So painful, he wanted to die. And then the wife said, curse God and die. Nothing. Because the influence, the blood of Jesus or the sacrifices, the works now removed. Let me conclude and say, the way to protect ourselves, protect our family, protect our property, protect whatever you are, is by the blood of Jesus. How do we do it? The Bible says in the uh, and since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe and therefore I speak. We also believe and therefore speak. What do we believe? By the blood of Jesus, I'm saved. By the blood of Jesus, I'm protected. By the blood of Jesus, I'm forgiven. And by the blood of Jesus, the devil will be defeated. Amen. In conclusion is, Omicron is defeated by the blood of Jesus. I pray for my wife. I pray for my children. I pray for my uh, grandchildren every day, right? About the blood of Jesus. I change my prayer a little bit. I bleed for the blood of Jesus. Do it and see what will happen. The tongue has the power of life and death. And those who love it and eat the fruit. The, the, in, in the book of Hebrews, the 13, 15, say the fruit of our lips as a sacrifice. So whenever we confess positively over our family, over ourselves, over our children, over everything I have, I possess, the Lord will give us the fruits. What we believe, we speak it because tongue, the words come out from our mouth is life and death. We, we want life, not death from the Omicron. So let's stand up and let's... Uh, I make a faithful confession here. All right? This is a prayer for yourself. Come on, let's uh, stand up and uh, read that confession together as a prayer. You ready? One, two, three. Father, thank you for always hearing my prayers and allowing me to walk in your divine favor. I plead my cause before you because I have been justified to your blood in the name of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus over my life, my home, my family, over all my affairs, and over all which you have made me a steward. I plead the blood of Jesus on the doors of my mind, my body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit and my emotion. Therefore, I am confident that I am protected by the blood of the Lamb, and nothing shall by any means come to harm me and my family. I declare no weapon that is formed against me shall prosper, because this is my heritage as a servant of the Lord. I bleed the blood over my children, my grandchildren, and others that are connected to me. Lord, you say that the life of the flesh is in the blood. Thank you for being the life sustainer. For your blood has cleansed me from sin and shame. I am now a partaker and joint heir to the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Let's enjoy our lunch.
Amen.